take a look at this map of the northern Chinese city of Tianjin about 100 years ago. Here we see slices of the city seemingly given away to Britain, France, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Belgium, Italy, and Japan. You can see the borders literally follow the different streets, which makes you wonder, what exactly were these territories? Why did eight different countries, well nine if you want to be a smart aleck and include China itself, share different parts of this one city, and how did this all work? This video is brought to you by NordVPN. This is the modern day city of Tianjin, nowadays one of the largest cities in China, and one of four cities in China that runs themselves as a prefecture level city. The others, if you're curious, are the capital Beijing, Shanghai, and inland Chongqing. Now, turn the clock back about a century and 0.5 halves, and you see the city divided up between all these diff- Okay, you just saw the intro, I'll get into it. Tianjin lies not directly on the ocean, but near the Bohai Sea, at the intersection between the High River and the very northern end of the Grand Canal, part of a massive series of canals stretching throughout eastern China, from the Tonghui River, connecting the Yellow and the Yangtze, and stretching as far inland as the old capital Luoyang. This makes the city not merely Beijing's port city like Piraeus to Athens, but also a key node for grain from the south to be transported further north and inland. For centuries, China saw itself as the center of the world, as is the origin of its native name, literally meaning central state or middle kingdom. I mean, those names have different energies going on, but you know what, they both convey the message. China didn't trade with the outside world, per se, so much as it demanded tribute from neighboring kingdoms. Indeed, this is what Zheng He was looking for on his famous expeditions in the 15th century, kingdoms across southern Asia and eastern Africa to give tribute to the Ming Dynasty. When the British sent their ambassador George McCartney to the court of the Qing Dynasty in 1792, the Qing were at the height of their power. A continent-spanning empire at the center of civilization, no real threats along any of their borders, and a thriving, self-sufficient economy meant that the British were seen as little more than yet another potential tributary. Since 1760, the Qing had allowed the British to trade in the port of Guangzhou. Yes, I'm going to use the modern Mandarin names. But many industrialists wanted to expand their presence into larger markets. Like, for instance, the nearly 300 million strong population of the rest of China. While they never went full closed country like Japan, though, many across China grew increasingly concerned about the encroachment of European merchants and missionaries in its land, and especially how they would affect their grip on power. Now, there's also a story of how when McCartney greeted the Qing court, the court responded to him in Latin, as it was the last language any European visitors to China spoke. This is a fun story, but it's not exactly true, even discounting the fact that the very non-Roman polos existed. What actually happened was McCartney brought along four Chinese Catholic priests as interpreters, who spoke Latin for religious reasons, as well as Chinese for being Chinese reasons, but not English, so the conversation would have been translated through Latin. The mid-19th century saw disaster after disaster for the Qing, from their loss to the British who just wanted to sell drugs so they would have something to trade, to the sheer devastation brought on by the deadliest civil war in human history, all thanks to this guy saying he was Jesus' brother, and then another opium war, this was the beginning of what China would call its century of humiliation. At the end of the Second Opium War in 1860, China and the victorious British, French, Russians, and Americans signed the Treaty of Tianjin, Gee, where have I seen that quartet before? The treaty mainly stipulated that the Qing opened China up a bit more to the four powers, recognized extraterritorial law for their citizens while on Chinese soil, told the Qing government not to use the character for barbarian to refer to them in documents, and to open up more cities, including Tianjin itself, to foreign trade. If you see my Why Japan Never Became a Superpower video, this is essentially the same kind of unequal treaties these countries made Japan sign at around the same time. The British and French territorial concessions in Tianjin opened up that year. Now, I really should explain what exactly these were, as these weren't necessarily true colonies. Like, this wasn't like Hong Kong or Macau where these were full-fledged colonies or territories. Rather, these were concession territories, parts of Tianjin that belonged to Britain and France, and later several other countries, but we'll get into that history in a second, and where they could build churches and factories and river ports and military garrisons and the like, whilst running their own police forces to enforce their own laws. So they were more like bases of operation than actual sovereign territories or colonies. These were not unique to Tianjin either, as similar concessions were also granted in Shanghai, Guangzhou, and even the capital in the Beijing legation quarters. 
Similar arrangements had also been made in the past, with Dejima in southern Japan, and were essentially the origins of why Macau became Portuguese for so long. A good modern-day example of concession territories, although decidedly anti-colonialistic, are the grounds of the United Nations headquarters. The UN operates four primary facilities in New York, Geneva, Vienna, and Nairobi, and diplomats and officials need to be able to get to these sites without being held up by American, Schengen, or Kenyan border control and visa policies, as well as different local laws that could make things just way more complicated than they need to be. Like, this is the United Nations, they already have a complicated enough job. Things, however, really started to take off in the 1890s. Wow, that sounds like I'm talking about some startup, but no, I'm just talking about colonialism. After the First Sino-Japanese War, Japan took over the Liaodong Peninsula and secured itself its own concession in Tianjin. However, the triple intervention between France, Germany, and Russia would force Japan to return the peninsula to China. Then German Ambassador Alfred Pedram was really like, Hey, we forced Japan to give you back the Liaodong Peninsula. Now give us special treatment too. All this, perhaps unsurprisingly, resulted in widespread unrest. While several groups began to take up arms against the Western powers, it was ultimately the boxers, named after their use of martial arts, which at the time was called Chinese boxing, who would take up the mantle, starting what historians would call the Boxer Rebellion. The Boxer Rebellion started with attacks against Chinese Christians and Christian missionaries in 1899, with many consequently seeking refuge in the Beijing Legation Quarters. The newly formed Eight Nation Alliance stormed the Dagu Forts in Tianjin, and after that the Boxers began the siege of the Legation Quarters, now with the support of Dowager Empress Zi Shi. The siege lasted for 55 days, until it was eventually broken by the Allied forces, eventually forcing the Qing government to sign a new round of treaties the following year. Russia would gain its own concession in 1900, followed by Italy, then Austria-Hungary, and then followed by Belgium, despite not taking part in the Boxer Rebellion, other than economic and military support. Two years later, the Belgians would also be given an official monopoly over trams and electric lighting within the city, eventually even expanding to within other foreign concessions. During World War I, or WE, the Chinese Republic would declare war on the Central Powers in 1917, by which point the fate of the German and Austro-Hungarian concessions were… predictable. The era of these concessions would gradually come to an end by the 1930s and 40s. You see, Japan at this time was starting to expand its own empire across much of East and Southeast Asia, first Korea, then Manchuria, then much of China itself. Japan invaded Tianjin in 1937, but left the concession territories alone at first. But soon after, the British, Americans, and later Italians would order their forces out from their concessions, with the British landing them away in 1943, essentially so China would still side with them and not the Axis powers. Which, granted Japan was invading them, so that was probably not a hard decision, but still. After the end of World War II, or WE, and later the establishment of the current People's Republic of China, these former territories were, no surprise, more or less erased from existence. Victoria Road and Rue de France became Jiafang North Road, and not much other than a few old buildings stands in this place. Which, considering the history that unfolded here, is probably more for the best. Has this ever happened to you? Oh boy, time to log back onto my favorite website. Hello, Jonathan Adam Weiss. Wait, how do you know my middle name? Here's a 5% discount on hemorrhoid cream. Hang on, I haven't told anyone about, can we interest you in this life-size T-Rex skeleton from Hamburger Schlemmer? Wait, that was, that was literally a dream I had last night. Also, we're sleeping with your favorite wife. Hey, Thor, can you get this? <laughs> Thanks. Your private information should be, you know, your private information. But not all of us can ask for a favor from the Nordic gods whenever a website knows more about you than you do. However, there is an even better Nord for this purpose. NordVPN. NordVPN is a virtual private network service which, in a few short clicks, can help you stay safe from potentially dangerous downloads, protects your accounts on public Wi-Fi, and bypass all sorts of geo-restrictions to access new movies and TV shows, or even keep tabs with stuff going on at home while abroad. Trust me, i found a lot of important sites to be very finicky about me not being in the US whenever I'm in Europe. Through NordVPN.com slash Canubis, you can connect to one of NordVPN's thousands of servers worldwide to protect yourself from hackers and near do wells let me just hack into the neighbor. Oh no, I'm having a non-existence. And it's all at the click of a button. Don't like the internet in this country? You can be in this country. Don't like that? Well, now you can be in this country. Go to nordvpn.com slash Canubis to get a two-year plan plus four extra months for free. And what's even better is you also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. 
I love long-term transactions that give you some leeway in case you're not fully on board with it. Again, that's nordvpn.com slash to help secure your internet experience and support the channel.